just so that I have it. Hello. Um, just so I have it in case anyone asks. Um, so thank you all so much um, for coming. It's really lovely. I really did not want to cancel. I wanted to make sure I could be here with all of you this evening. Um, and I hope that you're all busy cleaning and doing whatever else and um, listening in on the background <laughs> as you all should be. Um, so what, I mean, this is going to be, you know, I, I, I don't intend for this to be any longer than the length of what I did on Chavez, which was like 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and so I just thought I'd, I just wanted to kind of present the material. I think what I'll, I'll just share my screen so that you can see um, the sources while I talk. Um, and so what I wanted to do was to, to look at um, just the idea of starting with, with, um, with disgrace and finishing with praise. Um, which is one of the real themes of the Seder. You know, so I brought as the first source, the Mishnah. Um, oh, and by the way, I have the screen share on. So the comments, it's hard for me to see if anyone comments. So totally feel free to just like unmute yourself if you want to say anything. Um, so yeah, anyway, so the Mishnah in Masechet um, Sachim gives the, the, in the 10th parak, the fourth Mishnah gives a rough outline for what a Seder actually looked like back then. Um, it basically says, all right, you pour the second cup, you do manishtana, machil bignut umasayim b'shevach, translated as you begin with, the, with disgrace and finish with praise, v'doresh me'arami ovedavi ad shigmor kola parsha kula. And you take that chunk of text of arami ovedavi, which is the bikurim ceremony that is found in, in Deuteronomy, that when the farmer, once they get to the land of Israel, you harvest the first fruits, you bring them to the Beit HaMikdash, you hand them to the Kohen, and you recite this like six verse little summary of the history of, sort of basically the history of the Jewish people until that point, um, right? My father was a wandering Aramean, went down to Egypt, became a great nation, we were enslaved, God took us out, now we can be in the land of Israel, yay. Right, um, and so that's the halacha, according to Jill. Did you say something? Sorry. No. Oh, okay. Um, so that really is the Haggadah according to the Mishnah. Right, pretty straightforward. That's Magi. Now, interestingly, um, the Rabbi David Zvi Hoffman, um, who's a fairly recent uh, rabbi in the past couple hundred years, he raises an interesting question, which is. Originally, was this one statement, meaning, was Machil Bignut or Messiah and Beshevach, right? You start with disgrace and finish with praise, simply a summary of Doresh Mi Arami Ovedavi. In other words, was, did, did the Mishnah intend to say, you begin with disgrace and you finish with praise? And here's how you do that you use this text of Arami Ovedavi, which starts with the wandering and ends with praising God for being able to be in the land of Israel, right? And so what he actually argues is that originally in the time of the Mishnah, yes, that was all one idea. Um, and then the problem became once um, the Jewish people were kicked out of Israel um, and that happened pretty quickly um, and we're all in exile. Well, the whole passage of Arami Ovedavi becomes not really so representative of our actual notions of redemption because the Jews are scattered all over the world. We're not farmers in the land of Israel. And so it's really like the narrative of our Magid really shouldn't culminate in, well, now we're get to be in the land of Israel, bringing our first fruits to the Beit HaMikdash, right? It's simply not relevant anymore. And so he argues that's when Machil Begnud of Esayim B'Shevach split from Doresh Mi Arami Ovedavi into two separate ideas. Right, and so now we tell the Haggadah with disgrace and praise, and also we use our Meovenavi, right, which is actually true. You know, uh, certainly the Haggadah doesn't get any shorter over time; it gets much longer as <laughs> sort of people keep like throwing in their own ideas as we go, and we don't say no to anything, so everything just gets folded in. Now that would explain. <coughs> excuse me, I'm just gonna take a sip of tea. That would explain the Gemara in Psachim. Because the Gemara in Psachim, commenting on this Mishnah, asks, my big newt, right? What's the disgrace? Interestingly, it doesn't ask what the praise is, it asks what's the disgrace. And here we get two very different opinions. Rab says, mitchila ovdei avodah zara hayu avoteinu. So Rab says, it's the passage, and this of course does end up in the Haggadah, 
that we say in the beginning, our ancestors were idol worshipers. <coughs> and we do say that. And interestingly, you know, we could have talked about all as, as some of us are studying um, Isaiah together a couple of times a week. And you very easily could have discussed all of the times that we slipped as a people and worshiped idols after it's the right? But since we have to go back before that, we're going back all the way to um, Terah, actually, Abraham's father. And that's that part of the Haggadah where we start to talk about all of a sudden Terah and it's called the book of Joshua um, and all, you know, our ancestors who were idol worshipers before they even knew that that was like a bad thing, right? Because Abraham, of course, is the first Jew. So Shmuel then says, actually, it's Avadim Hainu, <coughs> which we also know well from the Seder. We were slaves. So these are two very different ideas of what this gnut, this, this disgrace are. We were idol worshipers or we were slaves. And so we'll come back to like talking about what exactly those differences are and what the significance is behind them. Um, here, there are some, some sources here. None of them is essential, but I think they're interesting in laying the groundwork uh, for sort of an analysis of what is going on with this disgrace praise thing. So the Maharal says, um, ask, you know, based the question of like, why not just have the praise and that's it, right? Why do you have to dis start with the disgrace? What does that contribute, right? And I think that, you know, it might be kind of obvious to us, but still worth it's worth articulating that what he says is, you know, the light of, he uses the, the metaphor of night and then day, right? And day is profound because it's preceded by night, right? Light is preceded by darkness. And you really achieve what you, <coughs> excuse me, you appreciate what you have when you first see what you didn't have, right? And so it enhances the gratitude for everything that we do have. And so it's appropriate to start with the disgrace first, because then you, then you really appreciate when you reach um, the praise. Okay. Now, the next thing is, I thought was really interesting, is the Orachaim points out that the Pasuk, a Pasuk we probably know intuitively just from having been at so many seders in our day, um, that the Pasuk goes, V'higarete levincha bayom hahu le'emor. You shall tell your son, right? He got it, huh? like from the word Hagada, mm -hmm. on that day, saying the Emor, right? And he says, well, okay, one commandment, telling your child on that day to say, right? Why doesn't just say you should say to your child on that day or you should tell your child on that day? Why do you have both? Mm -hmm. And he actually, I think, does a beautiful job of tying this straight into the Gnut and the Shabbach. And he says, it's the, why are there two words here? Because it is an exact, um, I guess, metaphor for the experience of starting with disgrace and ending with praise. Why? He got it to, the hagid is to actively tell something, right? The emor is just to spew, just to say whatever. It rolls off the tongue easily. He got it to takes effort, it takes energy. And so he says, the disgrace, that's harder to say. No one wants to talk about the ugly parts of their lives, you know, the ugly parts of their history. And so that's the word mehigadita. It's acknowledging. It takes extra effort in order to be able to do that. And the amveyamarta, that's the praise part. It's a lot easier to say praise, right? And so you don't need to put in that extra effort of speaking because it just rolls off the tongue, right? And so that's why this, I love that analysis of this pasuk saying that's why we have both, the higarita and the more to represent that the first step of this is a lot harder than the second step. Um, and so I wanted to use that idea before we go to the to the next source, I wanted to just go back up for a minute to this Gemara Msachim and think about Okay, what's really going on with Rav and Shmuel here? Some of us may have seen this, you know, this line before, oh, the idea of Machil Begnu Messiah Beshevach, and just said, okay, that's the structure of the story. But if we stop and think, there's a huge difference between what Rav and Shmuel are saying, right? Shmuel is saying, 
what's the gnu? What's the disgrace? Avadim hayinu, right? We were slaves. Okay, that's a very interesting definition of disgrace. Why? Because disgrace is something that's passive. I mean, here, like being, if you're a slave, it's not something you did. It's something that happened to you, right? It represents a low point in your life. Just like for us, you know, that low point might be thinking about after we lost a parent or a child or a spouse or someone close to us in our lives, right? We hit a really hard point in our lives, right? But it's something that happened to us. It's not something that we actively chose for ourselves. And so it's interesting that Shul says that that's the disgrace, right? Because you would think, you know, the Hebrew word gnut, maybe it doesn't have the most precise translation, but it doesn't indicate like a tragedy, right? It indicates some element of disgrace, shame, etc. So it's interesting that Rav, that, excuse me, that Shmuel assigns it a, pl a place of something that in which you're passive, right? It's something bad that happened to you. And actually it's interesting to see <laughs> There are, uh, you know, different mafarshim that kind of try to tackle this more in depth and how that they kind of have to figure out, okay, so what exactly is the gnut? And maybe it's that we were slaves and then the shameful, that's not the shameful part, but the shameful part is that we weren't able to worship God or whatever it is, right? Because you have to kind of do a little bit of a dance in order to make that fit. And I think that that makes Rob's opinion, you know, very interesting, right? No, we were idol worshipers at the beginning. And he's not referencing any kind of discomfort or tragedy in our lives. I mean, back with Terach, you know, Avraham clearly comes from a wealthy family, right? He's well off and he, he just, you can't just grow into wealth randomly, right? You have to start with it. And so he becomes wealthy as he, you know, he and Sarah venture out into the world of preaching monotheism, but probably he started off pretty well too. So there's no apparent discomfort with any part of his life, right? But yet, they're idol worshipers, which is a fact of their history, a fact, I guess it's, we should say of our history, um, but one that, you know, certainly in that sense is absolutely a choice, whereas slavery is not. And so the gnut there is much, I think, more fitting. Now, you could ask the question of, well, monotheism didn't exist yet, so why is it embarrassing to say that Terach, Abraham's father, was an idol worshiper if monotheism didn't exist, but you know, we could go into that um, a different time. Um, so that's that's where we leave off. So Rob and Shmuel, vastly different concepts of what it means to start off with GNU, to start off with disrespect or disgrace, I should say. So bearing that in mind, um, I wanted you know to think about, okay, so why is it important that we have both? I think for Shmuel, for me, it's easier to deal with Shmuel, right? The fact, Avadim Hayinu, I think it's always maybe someone who has great sense of pride, perhaps even arrogance, might have a hard time talking about a time in their lives when they really did struggle. You know, they hit rock bottom or whatever it was, were struggling, you know, with, with some kind of loss. But I think in the grand scheme of things, it's certainly easier to talk about something, a bad spot we were in, an Avadim Hayinu versus an idol worshiping situation, right? Versus something low spot we were in, but because we made choices. And so I think it's certainly, you know, it's important for to have Shmuel in there, right? To be able to talk about those low points. But I also want to really appreciate what Rob is saying, right? That we, in order to, to tell a full story of something, to tell the full story, story of your history as a people, you have to also be able to talk about those uncomfortable parts, right? The parts where you made bad choices, things you probably didn't really want to articulate at the Seder table, and yet you know it's important to do so. And so with that in mind, I wanted to now bump down to the Maharsha. Um, so he comments also on this Gemara. <coughs> Excuse me. And he comments here on Machil Big to Messiah Meshabach, and he says, okay, why? The concept is that one day, excuse me, that on the day of ultimate joy of a person, one should remember first one's lowliness and disgrace in order not to separate one's consciousness from that. For this reason, one expounds also from my father was a wandering Aramean and necessarily must acknowledge and thank God all the more. 
right? And so I really like the way that he connects it specifically to your dot, right? To your consciousness. Um, he says, you know, it's easy on the day of praise to detach yourself. It's easy when you're feeling good to detach yourself from the uncomfortable stuff that came before. And so that really what Machil ben Gnud and Masai Meshavach does is achieve a place where we can be able to connect them, right? And that we should bring into our consciousness the lower points in our lives. Um, and as I, as I said on, on Shabbos, um, you know, and it's only, I mean, the news has only gotten even more grim since then. Um, I really feel, you know, this, uh, the whole Ukraine, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I think has just been beyond, I've just found like beyond resonant and horrifying on every possible level. Um, and if any of you were in Shul, Shabbos Zachor, I spoke about that also. And I just kind of feel like can't really have a holiday now without acknowledging what is happening um, to fellow human beings, you know, at the very second, um, at this very second and at every second. I mean, it's just beyond, beyond anything I certainly thought I would see in my lifetime of one country just invading another and then unleashing just horrific cruelties um, onto people. If anyone saw the New York Times just released a master, uh, you know, photo collection and testimonials of Busha and I mean it's just it's just beyond I could talk about Busha I always pronounce it wrong but I could talk about it all day and just how strongly I feel but anyways the reason I brought that up is because first of all I think it's important to to remember Ukraine regardless but also as I was studying this material last week um, Yoni's brother who's a professor of Soviet history at the Harvard Business School and his wife Ingrid who um, is also works in this field, has worked for the State Department in Kazakhstan, so certainly um, an expert in, in this whole Soviet region as well. They published a piece that I thought was very interesting and really tied back in to exactly what we were talking about with all these sources of Machil Beknud and Messiah and Beshevach. And so I, what I did here was I, I brought in some of the pieces. If anyone wants a copy of this, you could just um, email me. I'd be happy to send it to you um, of, the, of the source sheet. But what they, I mean, what they basically presented um, and gave this example of this massacre of 1940 that the Soviet secret police did um, on Polish prisoners, they're Polish prisoners of war, right? And buried basically 20,000, 21,000 bodies in mass graves. The Germans come along and discover them. And Stalin's like, oh no, it wasn't us, it was you guys, right? Just told the Germans, no, it was them told everyone else, no, it was the Germans. And then for all the horrible atrocities that the Soviet um, government committed against its own people throughout the 20th century, just engaged in a series of denials or just blaming someone else, but total refusal to take responsibility, acknowledge any responsibility, nothing, right? It was never us, it was always someone else. And essentially what, what Jeremy and Ingrid argue is that because Russia did that, they never once stopped and said, ooh, we have an ugly history, right? We did some really bad stuff. And they contrast that with the process that the allied forces kind of, you know, forced a little bit upon Germany, of which is like, no, no, <laughs> dear Germany, after World War II, you're going to grapple with, you're going to reckon with directly all of the what you did, right? And I think that we've seen that, thank God, that actually had a pretty positive effect overall in German society, right? Um, and being able to acknowledge that and, and take ownership and, of course, you know, I mean, somewhat... <laughs> Just the irony is now, you know, become a safe haven um, for some Jews escaping Ukraine, et cetera, right? And so it was that total failure to grapple with the past, the denial of that past, of the ugly past that they argue have allowed not just Putin, you know, Putin's a, a, a evil, crazy monster, right? But all of Russian society to kind of buy into this narrative, right? I think that's the question they're asking. Putin, fine, but all of Russian society, I mean, yes, there's propaganda, of course, and right now it's extreme, um, but it hasn't always been quite that bad, right? And, and so, and essentially, I mean, as I, as I bold, you know, it's just the fact that, no, if you deny the ugly parts of your history, it enables you to really do terrible things um, in the name of furthering your, your own nation and your own people and your own power. And that I think that this to me is like a really fascinating way of tying it together. And for me, emphasizing why Rob's opinion is so important, 
right? The saying that, mach, that we were idol worshipers, to be able to sit down at a Seder, the highlight of the Jewish people, and also say, yeah, no, yeah, God redeemed us. We were from slavery. It was great. We also were idol worshipers once upon a time. You know, this example of how the Soviet Union, Russia society totally failed to do that, I think really highlights the importance to me of why Rob said, no, this is what the Seder is, right? Because you can't really tell the story of your own people. You can't be a complete people, an honest people, full people, if you don't have, um, don't have that element of it as well, that element of reflection. Um, so those were my thoughts, um, and I'm happy if anyone wants to ask any questions or chat about anything, um, and uh, if not, you can totally feel free to go, um, and oh, oh, I'm just seeing everyone who's on now, uh, and at the very least, um, I want to wish everyone a Chag Sameach. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> oh, hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Oh, no, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad I made it through this. <laughs> Wait, how's everyone doing okay? Yeah? Okay. Cleaning going okay? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Sam. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> What'd you say? How you feel? Sam went like, ah, for cleaning. Yeah. It's yeah, it's always great when Pesach starts on a Friday night, you know, no. it's, that's the that's the best. Oh, I know, I know. I don't, I wouldn't have survived this year if that hadn't been the case. I know. At least you get a full week of, of yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Has anyone been to Shalom's in the past couple of days? Is it still stocked? Um, when was I there? I was there Monday. Uh-huh. What about today? the shul? Was that yesterday? 